Hi, so today um, I'm going to be talking to you about the algebra in the Renaissance, and I'm the first person to talk about this. Um, it's going to be mainly focused around Italian emphasis in France and Nicolas Chouquet, but um, we will get some overview of the Renaissance, um, both in Italy and in France and in general. Um, and then we'll look at some problems that they had to do and a proof of something that they had to do as well. So let's get into it. Um, first, an overview of the Renaissance. Um, it was a 14th century artistic movement reaching its peak in the 16th century. Um, and that's just a generalization. The Renaissance happened for different people um, in different countries, depending on the country that you look at. Um, Italy was one of the first um, to enjoy the Renaissance and come up with a lot of it and often considered the birthplace of it. Um, and so that's an earlier Renaissance. And then the French Renaissance wasn't until like 100 years after Italy, Italy started their Renaissance. So um, it just kind of depend, depends on when the country um, got in this movement. Um, the Renaissance does mean rebirth. Um, and this idea came from religion. So they started off beforehand, um, before the Renaissance, really focusing on religious aspects and the supernatural and that like, um, especially with just like Christianity and that um, God was over everything and that it was just very religiously based. Um, but then the Renaissance happened and they realized that humans could do a lot. And so they kind of formed this concept called humanism, which is just the philosophy that humans are at the center of everything and focusing on human achievements and human interests. And that's why we see a lot of new um, art and math and science and things that are more worldly and of human origin. Um, and it wasn't that religion like was just kicked out to the curb, but there was a lot more enhancement um, in especially art with accurate human inclusion. So like the reason why Leonardo da Vinci came up with the human body diagram and that all the pictures like you see in this slide um, are actually more accurate representations of people um, is because we, they became more curious about the human um, abilities and form. And so specifically in Renaissance math, um, with all of these ideas and inventions and technology going back and forth between countries, um, there was a lot more need for trade and more math needed to figure out more complex trading problems. So most of the advancements in math we have seen are were needed for merchant trading. Um, there are practical texts, detailed problems in the context needed for young merchants. Um, there were some in geometry and astronomy, like the calendar and elementary number theory, but those were not as common as the texts for young merchants and needing to trade different things. Um, so some common problems we might have seen in Renaissance math are number one, which is my favorite problem. Um, if a field is 150 feet long, a dog stands at one corner and a hare at the other, but the dog leaps nine in each leap and the hare leaps seven feet in each leap. So then they wanted to figure out how um, how many leaps would the dog actually catch the rabbit, which is kind of funny. Um, and then another problem that you might see is that the gold florin is worth five um, lire, 12 soldi, and six denarii in Luca, but how much in gold florins are 13 soldi, nine denarii worth? So these problems are just problems in algebra. Um, they don't require, you know, calculus or anything like that. Um, they're just simple, like, linear problems, but these were common in the mathematical texts that they um, would use. And so that leads us to like the Italian re Renaissance, since it was like the birth of the movement. Um, in the beginning, many artists and inventors were actually deemed crazy by the population of Italy, especially since they were the first. But by the end, they were charging high prices for their work, which was the need for the math um, there, because the high fluctuation of trade. Um, but science and math were not actually as important specifically in Italy um, as art and literature were. That's why you hear a lot of Italian artists and works coming from Italy for the Renaissance. Um, and so that's why you hear a lot of French names in math is because it wasn't until the Renaissance moved up north into France that really the focus on science and math took hold. 
Um, so that leads us into the Italian abbasists, where just an abbasist is a class, a mathematician who wrote texts um, that they taught in the math needed for sons of merchants in school. So these merchants had kids and the abbasists wrote these basically textbooks and taught the math to the sons so that they could be well versed in merchant and trade when they got older. Um, Italy was the start and hub of this and so they actually studied Arabic math thoroughly like we do in class um, and so a lot of the math was based in algebra like the problems we saw earlier. Um, this is actually a counting board in the picture. You can see the Roman numerals were used with the counting sliding um, pieces there. And those were used to keep account ledgers and things, but they figured out a new way and they only needed to use pen and paper. And it was actually more cost effective to use pen and paper. It saved them a lot of money. And so they transitioned to pen and paper. Um, the Italian abbasists did that during this time. Um, unlike Islamic math, however, which was very rhetorical and didn't use a lot of symbols, um, they were allowed to use symbols for unknowns. And so we have these Italian words here, um, and then they represented different things. So they came up with some words to mean certain things, um, like cosa means thing, senso means square, cubo means cube, radice means square root, and pio is plus, and they know minus. And so those were used in the problems, and we'll see that here next. Um, so an example, find two numbers such that multiplying one by the other makes eight and the sum of their squares is 27. Um, so they would go about this problem supposing that the first number is, and then the Italian, um, a thing minus the root of some quantity. And the second number is a thing plus the root of some quantity. And you can see in the Italian there, uh, the lining up of the words that we talked about in the last slide. And so in our notation, we have that that is x minus root y times x plus root y equals 8 and x minus root y squared plus x plus times x plus root y squared is 27. Um, so then they just solve that system of equations algebraically and they would get that x equals root 43 over 2 and y equals 11 over 4. And so that was um, a way to solve maybe a trading problem where they needed two numbers um, such that it's 8 and two numbers that squared 27. Um, and that was useful to them and taught in schools. And so the French Renaissance then, once it moved north a little bit, like I said, almost 100 years after Italy had already started theirs, uh, Francois I, we use King 15, 15, 1547, really kickstarted this movement in France. He actually invited Leonardo da Vinci to France and um, invented a ton of architects and other artists to decorate, including the Royal Chateau at Chambord. And you can see that in that picture, it's a beautiful building, um, looks very Italian Renaissance like as we've seen in some architecture before. Um, and he was the one that brought all of that to France and worked with the French there. Um, and so then looking at a specific mathematician in France, we have Nicolas Chouquet. Um, he wasn't really sure when if he was born. It was about 1445, they think, and he but he did definitely live until 1488. Um, he was a French mathematician who supported the works of Fibonacci, and he was a follower of him, um, which is kind of cool since we hear Fibonacci's name a lot. Um, he was most famous for though writing a three-part treatise called Triparty in La Ciencia des Nombres, um, which contains algebra and arithmetic problems and in three parts, hence the word triparty, which triparty is not a French or Italian word, but it kind of comes from parte, which is Italian, and then tri, tree, which is three, and so it's like three parts, but it's more commonly known as just triparty. Um, the algebra in the book was actually already known to Islamic Islamic mathematicians, but it was the first detailed algebra in French. And so the French were actually had something that they could read and learn algebra from, which was cool. Um, so in Triparty Part 1, um, he focuses on the Hindu Arabic place value system, uh, zero positive and negative numbers, and rules with fractions. And so he really focuses on that there. Um, and something he ended up proving was if the fraction a over b is less than c over d where a b c and d are positive numbers then if you add the numerators and the denominators together that number is going to be greater than a over b but less than c over d 
And so we're, we are going to see that proof, go through that proof here. Um, so if we suppose that A over B is less than C over D, then we can multiply um, on both sides, right, and cancel out the B and the D, um, do the same thing to both sides. And so we have AD is less than BC. Um, and then we get two trains of thought here to come up with our answer. So following on the left, um, on both sides, we can add A plus B. That's just because we can add whatever or multiply whatever on as long as we do it on both sides. Um, if we add AB to both sides, we can factor out an A on the left and B on the right and then divide. And so then we end up with A over B less than A plus C over B plus D. And similarly on the right hand side over here, if we just add DC to both sides, we can factor out a D and on the left and a C on the right and then divide and we have A plus C over B plus D less than C plus C over D. And so then those two together is a compound inequality where A over B is less than A plus C over B plus D, which is less than C over D. Um, and so that's relatively like algebraically simple, but again, this was the first detailed in French. And so uh, the French people had little means of being able to read this and study this unless they knew um, Islamic or Arabic. Um, so in part two then, in triparty part two, he presented on roots of numbers, including compound roots and index radicals. Now compound root is like what you see in the example down here at the bottom, where there's a root inside of a root already. And then an indexed radical is just a radical that's not a square root. It could be cube root, fourth root, et cetera. Um, and he used the fraction rule to extract square roots. Um, he introduces notation, so we had those Italian words before, but this time he just writes like a symbol for it, which is getting closer to how we write symbols um, in our mathematical notation. And so the P over the line with it is plus, the M with the line over it is minus, and then R squared is a square root and R cubed is a cube root. So you may see something like this in his work um, with the example here, R squared 14, um, the P with the line over it, and then R squared 180 is actually written in our no notation as square root of 14 plus square root of 80. Um, and so that's pretty interesting. Um, and then in triparty part three, um, he really focuses on the algebra here. He introduces exponential notation. So for example, one to the third equals x to the third and two to the fifth equals two x to the fifth. And so he wasn't like evaluating these exponentials, but he was simply just meaning those to mean like linear equations since he was doing algebra. Um, and so that you can see the number was the coefficient to the x and then the um, exponent is actually what's applied to the x and not the number. Um, something interesting that I found is that this was the first time this expression was used, um, or the first time that was used was a to the zero equals one for any a, and he generalized that result. That wasn't quite found out before, but he included a lot of example in this third part where the number to the zero power is one. Um, and so that was pretty significant for him in following that. And then he also solves equa various equations of the, this form where it's a to the x to the n plus b to the x n plus n equals c to the x n plus 2n. Um, and it's, that's just a system of equations and he works on solving a lot of those as well. These are my references. <laughs>